Hi everyone, we are on our third week of this Psych 2001 course, and we're talking about JS Psych finally. Uh, we're going to be using this library to build cognitive psychology experiments for the web. If we jump over to the course website, I haven't added week three yet. I'm in the middle of doing that right now. So if we look at our studio, um, I have a third folder made for this week. And if we jump in there, we can see I've got an index QMD where I'm writing the blog post. So you'll be doing something like this as well. If I render this, we can take a look at what is in store for this tutorial. And we're going to go over what is JS Psych a little bit, look at the JS Psych documentation, talk about getting it on your computer. There's more than one way to use the library. And then we're going to go through the uh, JS Psych Simple RT demo. That's right on the website. And connect this demo, which is about how to build a really basic experiment, uh, to an actual cognitive psychology issue. So why would you want to run a simple RT task? Well, that connects to um, some issues that I'll point to in this reading. So let's get started. We're going to do a brief overview of the JS Psych documentation. And so I encourage you to go over to this website and check it out yourself. It's super helpful. There are multiple versions of JS Psych and we're going to be using 7.3. Uh, the sidebar, I think if you make the website wider, you'll see more of this stuff automatically, but it shows a lot of different things. We're going to be jumping into the tutorial section here and talking about these things. And you can head over and read them yourself and work through the tutorial yourself as well. I'm going to kind of do a screencast of me walking through this tutorial. There is a bunch of JavaScript functions and there's a, you can click in the reference section to learn more about individual functions. You can use the search bar and start typing um, for words and it's going to show you sections in the documentation where this word appears so you can like quickly find things. It's pretty great. Uh, one more thing. Oh, we're already at the list of plugins. So many experiments in cognitive psychology have a similar basic, uh, you can think about them in the same abstract way. Typically the task will involve presenting some kind of stimulus to a participant and collecting some kind of response from the participant uh, about that stimulus. And uh, this might occur many times over an experiment. So any, an experiment might involve several trials where a particular stimulus or a collection of stimuli are presented and a particular response or collection of responses are given. And those are pretty abstract terms. Uh, what is the stimulus? It could be a picture, it could be a sound, it could be all sorts of things. And what JS Psych has for us are little plugins, they're called, that will help you present some stimulus on a web browser. So we can see here is we got audio ones, there's all sorts of other ones, HTML, images, and so on, and collect particular kinds of responses from a participant. There's a lot more in the list of plugins. Things can get pretty advanced here, but uh, we'll be going back to this reference section many times to learn more about what the plugins offer. As you become even more advanced, it's totally possible to program your own plugins because this whole suite is uh, open source open source software. And we can uh, actually get the all of the code from a GitHub repository. So that's a just a quick overview of the JS Psych website if you haven't checked it out yet. We're going to be starting with the demo experiment. And uh, before we do that, let's move on to this question here of getting JS Psych on your computer. Um, 
So there's two ways to do this, and it's good to know about both of the ways. The first way you can do it is obtain the library from GitHub, and I've got the link here, and that'll be posted on the course website. If you go to uh, the JS Psych website and click on the home page, uh, I guess we can't see. I think I need to make the web page a little bit smaller for this to appear. Yeah. Okay. If it was this big, you'd be able to see this link right here, which is to the GitHub repository. And if you go to the GitHub repository, this is what I mean about the open source aspect of this. You can, if you wanted to, just download the whole thing. But uh, in order to obtain the latest release, Go over to the releases section and click on that and download the jsyc.zip folder. And this one will contain all of the jsyc uh, files. All right. So uh, what I did was I already downloaded this and I put it into my Quarto blog. So if we head over to uh, my files here, we can see I added a folder called JS Psych, and inside of this folder is the contents of that unzipped folder. We could take a look at it. It has some MD files which provide information, like general information about this, uh, license files and things like that. It has lots of example code that you can check out, and the library is distributed in the dist folder and here we have lots of different js files a js file you can take a look at it it's uh, plain text and it is all javascript so these are all javascript functions that define the js psych library and all of the plugins so the main file js psych.js uh, is sort of the overall package and individual plugins have their own JS file. There's also a CSS file here and you can look at that. Uh, this one is um, for styling the websites and it makes the JS psych experiment look like the way that it does. All of these things can be modified by you later on. So what we've done is obtained the JS Psych library and put it in our Quarto uh, blog folder. The other way to get JS Psych, we can uh, take a look at that as we go into the tutorial here. So here's the tutorial and uh, let's get started. So we're gonna be doing something that is uh, called creating a simple reaction time test. At, the, at least that's what this is called here, a simple reaction time task. If I scroll down a little bit, basically what this experiment is, is on every trial you see a blue circle or an orange circle. It'll just be one. And you have to identify that circle as quickly as you can. You get one, I think the F key for the blue circle and the J key for the orange circle. And in this experiment, you'd be able to measure how fast the, that is the reaction time in between seeing the circle and pressing the button that people uh, use or that people would have in this experiment. Officially, you might call this one a two alternative force choice reaction time task because there's two alternatives that you have to, well, you have to respond to one of them. Sometimes it's called a choice reaction time test. And um, if you're interested in why anyone would want to run an experiment like this, there's a link on the course uh, for, from this assignment. And then we can just jump over there real quick. Um, so here we are. The, it links to the cognition textbook and if we, I think it's uh, information processing, the Donders processing stages section, you can review this. It describes three different really simple reaction time tests. 
one that involves choice, like the one we'll be programming, one that involves um, something called go, no go. So basically you would press the button if you saw one of the circles and you would withhold your response if you saw the other, other one. And uh, the simple reaction time test is there's just one stimulus and you just press the button as soon as you see it. And this textbook chapter goes over some, um, some things that early psychologists were trying to learn based on having people perform these three different tests. So we'll learn how to create this last test in uh, JS Psych. And one of your assignment goals is to be able to do that tutorial, demonstrate you can load it on your blog, but also modify it to see if you can produce these other two versions of the test. And that will give us some really great uh, intro familiarity to using this tool. So with that, you can see what's ahead by just uh, pausing this video and looking at the tutorial. We're gonna jump right in and I'm gonna make it bigger so it's easier to see. We're starting off with creating a blank experiment. So let's do that. You can just copy this text and uh, jump over to our studio. I've already got started right here, but I'm gonna start again just for example purposes. Make a new text file. Uh, I'm just gonna call this one test.html. It's totally blank. I copied in that text from the website and we're gonna get started. Uh, so from last time, uh, this is clearly an HTML document. It's got the head section, it's got the body section, and it's got a script section as well. Uh, what do we see so far? It's just things inside the head section. So there's a title called my experiment. And if, can I make this bigger and easier to see? You can see there's a, a script here and another one here and they're referring to uh, sources. That's the location of these JavaScript files. And this one is a link. It's an HTTPS link. It's actually linking to a location on the web where the jsyc.js file resides. So the jsyc library can be obtained through links. This is a link to where the plugin HTML keyboard response.js file resides on the web. Uh, so the way the tutorial is presented, it should work if you have an internet connection, uh, even if you haven't downloaded the JS Psych library. So if you've saved this file, like I have here, we can view it in a browser. So let's do that. Okay, I've loaded this up inside my Firefox browser. I can show you I've reloaded it. There, you can't see anything. It looks like nothing's happening. Notice the tab is called My Experiment. So the title that's being defined right here, that's the title property that's being displayed in the tab. So something happened, but nothing else has happened. We can also um, look up the developer tools here and notice, uh, actually we're not seeing anything here, which is a good sign. If you've made mistakes, you might see errors here. Just to give a quick example of that, let's say I do, um, I'm just gonna delete the P here. So now it's gonna search for this address that doesn't exist on the internet, I'm guessing. Oh, it's, got, it's a mistake. And if we reload the file now, uh, the mistakes are shown in here. Okay, so it's good to be looking at your web developer tools as you're going along to make sure things are working correctly. I'm gonna fix that mistake. All right. So in my example, what I want to do is actually I'm going to make it so that I'm using my own local files. This is an important exercise. It's important to understand how to do this. In HTML, it's possible 
to totally comment out things. So I'm doing the uh, left arrow and a exclamation mark and two dashes. And look what happens, everything goes gray. That means all this stuff won't get executed. And two more dashes and uh, the right arrow. And I'm containing all of this code, graying it out so it doesn't happen. So what I'd like to do is uh, show you how to load the necessary JavaScript libraries when you are using them on your local computer and you have the files. You would do this for lots of reasons, um, and we can discuss them in class. It's possible that this website that's serving the file might go down at some point, so that's not under your control. Um, if you want to avoid that, you could you know, eventually place all your code onto a server that you control that you find to be reliable, and you would point the website to a location on your server instead of a location on the internet. And that would be similar to pointing to a um, location on your local computer. So for example, let's just copy this first piece. And uh, what we need to do is load the jspsych.js file from the local computer. So the src input is for the location of this file. And this file is located in this folder right here, JS Psych. And I'm using a slash for the folder. You can go in there. It's in the dist folder. So I'm typing dist. And then I'm going, and this is the file we need to load, JS Psych.js. Okay. So by placing this inside of the uh, head description in this file, when we load the web browser, what we should do, what should happen is we'll get no errors because we did it correctly. We've actually in the background loaded up all of the JS psych functions inside that file. And we could tell that that occurred by going into the console that's right here and looking to see if any of the JS psych functions are available. So you could start typing J, and if, you know, I happen to know there's JS psych functions that are called JS psych, and notice they appear automatically, and that means they're loaded, so we can start using them. And there's a lot of different uh, JS psych functions we'll use later. That's one way to know that you successfully loaded the library. So a prerequisite for this tutorial is that we load this plugin called the plugin HTML keyboard response. So I'm going to load that one too. Uh, it's located in the same folder, and we have to go down plugin HTML keyboard response. It's kind of a long one. It's right here. It's got dashes in between all the words. So I'm just going to type it out. Uh, plugin html keyboard response.js great we did that and the final thing we will need to add the css file which is not javascript but um, that's okay it's a css file so this is the file the the location is Actually, it's not just jspsych.css, right? It is, again, in the jspsych slash dist. It is in these folders, so we need to add that. Okay. So we could have used those, those links, and this is how to do it with uh, local files. And just to double check it's all working, we'll go back here and reload, and it looks like it's working so far. So we can continue with the tutorial. Okay, part two, let's display a welcome message. So this part 
uh, involves a number of pieces. There's, a, I think, five major pieces. And uh, let's do them all one at a time. So this piece of code here is going to be, and we're going to put all this stuff inside the script portion of this file. So this initializes the JS psych program. I'll just say that for now. Formally, we're creating a, a new JavaScript object called JS psych that has some initialization uh, information in it. Next, we create something called the timeline. And this is, uh, this is syntax to create an empty JavaScript array and call it the word timeline. Keep going. Here we're going to declare a what's called a JavaScript object. It uses curly braces. And I'm just going to highlight this and tab it over just to keep it easier to read. This is our first JS Psych plugin using the HTML keyboard response plugin. This is going to display a message at the beginning of our experiment. And two more things. I guess I can just copy them in. We are pushing the welcome message to the timeline. And next is the last thing that we would do is to initial or that is run the timeline. It'll become more clear over the semester what each of these things are doing as you become more familiar with JavaScript. And uh, let's take a look at what happens first. So I save the file. Now when I reload the file, all of those JavaScript commands will be executed. And let's see what happens. Okay, we got some messages here. That's pretty normal. They're not errors. And we see a welcome message being printed on the screen. If you press a key to begin, that actually constitutes a response to, the, to that plugin. And that event is uh, removed from the timeline. All sorts of things are going on here in the background. Uh, but uh, we're starting to build our first experiments. I want to make two general comments here for those of you unfamiliar with JavaScript. I'll do them quickly, I hope. So this is a variable called timeline. It needs to be called timeline. Uh, well, maybe not, actually. That's not what I wanted to say. What I wanted to focus on is this is something called a JavaScript array. Um, to give you a feeling of what a JavaScript array is, we can mess around a little bit ourselves. So we could use the same syntax. So I could say var that creates a variable. Mat is the name of the variable. We could say whatever we want to be the name. And left and right, square brackets, and uh, a semicolon. Okay. That created a new variable, a new array called mat. If I type mat and press enter, we can see that it is an array, and we can like look at it a little bit to see what's going on here. So arrays are variables that you can that are, you could think of them like containers. They can contain multiple elements. It's possible to define them differently with elements already in them. So we could do like this with commas in between the elements. And now if we looked at that array, it would have three things in it. Uh, the, the arrays are a little bit funny in JavaScript. The first slot is called the zero slot, and it has a one in it. The next slot is called the one slot, and it has a two in it, and so on. We can put all sorts of things in here. Like I could add a word like this with 
quotations and um, then so we can have different types of information inside of an array it's even possible to put an array inside an array uh, so we could do like this and so we've got five things a one a two a three a string and an empty array all these things are in this array when we make the timeline um, we're going to be putting events in our experiment into this array for example the first event might be a welcome message the next event might be a consent form the next event might be instructions the next event might be the first trial of the experiment and so on and JS Psych will help us create and present those events as well as record responses to them. Note also that JavaScript arrays and other things in JavaScript. Uh, so, so JavaScript is object oriented in its style and things like arrays, are, they come along with abilities. That means there's one simple way to talk about it. You can see what the abilities are. These are kind of functions or, or uh, otherwise known as methods, things you can do to arrays, given that it's an array. I type the name of this array and I'm pressing the period. And we could see these are the methods associated with this array. These are things we can do with it. I'll just give you an example here. The push method allows us to uh, add to the end of an array and put something new in there. So let's say I wanted to push tiger. Um, let's press enter and look at what is in the array now. And the string tiger has been added to the end. Okay, we're not going to go into a whole tutorial, uh, tutorial about using arrays right now but this gives you some idea of them. So this is a array called timeline. This one here is also a JavaScript object type. And at, well, I guess it is a JavaScript object and not an array. It uses curly braces instead of square brackets, and it has a slightly different type of um, syntax and JS Psych makes use of this syntax in declaring its variables. To give you some examples, uh, I guess let's use my last name as an object and we'll start off with a curly brace and I, we could just make an empty one here and as you can see, it's not called an array, it's called an object. Now, objects have uh, a syntax where in order, you, can, you can store things in an object just like in an array. So an array has uh, different slots, right, that you could put things into. With an object, you can give each slot a name. So for example, you could say, age and colon that would be the name i could say five 500 years old and um now when we look at this object it actually has an age property and just going back to the syntax here there's a comma after each property that's named so we could we could add another one when we define this. So I could say hobbies, and I could say likes cats, right? And now we can see this object has an age property and a hobbies property, and we can uh, actually access them. So if we said crump.age, it's going to say 500, crump hobbies is going to say like cats so similar functionality but different syntax okay 
So this is a, an array called welcome. And it has these two properties so far, a type property, and this is the name of a JS psych plugin, and a stimulus property, which is a message in between quotations, meaning that's a string that, that uh, and uh, this plugin, what it does is it takes arbitrary HTML, displays it on the website, and collects a keyboard response. So we've pushed this object onto the timeline, as we can do with arrays, and then uh, we're initiating the run method from the JS psych library. And in here, we've we said run this timeline that we've defined and that gets us going and shows that first welcome message let's move on to showing instructions so what we're going to do is we're just going to keep on adding more plugins and building out this experiment so i'm copying this and going over to my file I like to declare these plugins in a logical order that represents kind of what happens in the experiment. So I'm just pasting this right here. There's a lot to look at. You should be able to, well, I'm gonna highlight this, tab it over. So this is a, it's a basically what we've done here, but with a few more things. Again, it is a JavaScript object the curly braces we're using the same plugin and the stimulus property is a little bit different now and it is not just text it contains html text we're using the back tick at the beginning and the end this allows you to write text across multiple lines which is handy sometimes and inside of here is JavaScript, sorry, HTML. That's going to display instructions. There's a couple things to note that are really important. We're going to be displaying instructions that show that blue circle as a picture. And so we are using the IMG HTML element that displays pictures. And also this other picture here. You need to have these pictures in order to display them. You can get them from the website right here. So what I did was I just dragged this picture right off the screen and dragged this picture right off the screen. And I put them in this folder right here. So this is where I'm building the experiment. And I made an IMG folder and I put the first one here and the second one here. And that matches the name of the folder right here. So it's looking, this script will be looking for an IMG folder with the blue.png image and so on. Okay. Now, if I just save this and head over at this point to reload the experiment, We'll see the welcome message, but if I press a key, we don't see the next instruction screen. And that's because I did not do yet a critical thing, which is adding the trial to the timeline. And we want to do that in order. So when you think about how, the, um, how JavaScript will be compiling this, it's going to go down this list. So you want to, if we're adding the welcome message, that'll happen first. And then we'll put this afterwards. We'll add the instructions after that. So I saved it. And if we reload, whoops, not that one, this one, we should see the instructions appear with the pictures. Cool. So we have done a couple things here. And well, actually, we'll go back and comment. Notice there's a new parameter that's been added post trial gap. And this is going to add a two second delay after people click this 
button here. And that can be help, helpful. Uh, you've read some instructions. When you press the button, there'll be a short pause before the experiment starts happening rather than just happening right away. Okay, before we continue, I want to prepare you for the idea that JS Psych plugins have many parameters. This, this one um, that we're looking at, we only see the type, the stimulus, and the post-trial gap parameters. And if we were to take a quick look, let's see, how would I do that? Jump over to the plugin section, find HTML keyboard response so that we can look at the documentation for this. Come on, there we go. We can see all the other parameters that are possible to use. So we've used the stimulus parameter, which takes HTML. And we, that's, uh, and that's, that's basically the ones that we've seen there. There's, there's other ones available. And as we start using these plugins, we'll talk about them as they come up. But you should, this is how you could find out what's available to you for each plugin. There's also parameters that are available across plugins. That, they're kind of general ones, and they might not be mentioned here. So I don't see the post-trial gap parameter listed there, and that's a more general parameter. I think that would be explained elsewhere in the documentation. So let's move on. Talking about displaying stimuli and getting responses. So we want to create trials that will show the um, blue square or blue circle or the orange circle one at a time and collect responses. We could use the HTML keyboard plugin that we've already loaded, but in the tutorial shows using a different one called the plugin image keyboard response. So we're going to load that plugin. I'm not going to use this way of doing it because this uses the web link. But um, I'm going to go back to the top. I'm going to copy our line here where we load the HTML keyboard response. And I'm just going to give the name image keyboard response, uh, which is the same one here. So that's our first step. And we're going to see an example of making one trial where we show a blue circle and one trial where we show an orange circle and then add both of those trials to the timeline. So you can see it happening right here and copy that code, jump over, go down to after the instructions. And I like to tab this out just to make it um, kind of fall in line. We're using the JS Psych image keyboard response plugin. This is another JavaScript object. We've called it blue trial. That's a good word for this because we're using the blue stimulus. We've got one for the orange trial, the orange stimulus. And we have a new stimulus or a new plugin parameter called choices. And this refers to keyboard responses that are allowed when this stimulus appears. So JS like, well, record your response when you press the letter F or the letter J on the keyboard. Finally, um, we're going to push these things onto the timeline, and we could do that right here at the end. Push blue trial, push orange trial, go back to our experiment now, do a reload, welcome screen, instruction screen. It's telling you here to press F when you see the blue square and press J when you see the or orange circle. Sorry, I keep saying square. 
and press any key to begin. So I'll press any key I want. Uh, there's the blue circle, I press F. There's the orange circle, I press J. And I'll, what is happening, I haven't, we haven't looked at it yet, but JSIC is recording all of this data, which is great. So it's recording what happened and how fast you press the buttons, and we'll look at the data later. For now, um, we accomplished this section. Okay. Next is this concept of preloading media. Depending on the type of thing you want to display with the web browser, it can be useful to how to preload it. Right. So once these things go on the internet, another person somewhere in the world is accessing your experiment and they have to download files to their local computer in order for it to work. If your experiment involves images and audio files and things like that, they'll have to download those things before they can be displayed. If timing's critical, it's important that those uh, files are downloaded before the website before the browser tries to display them. So it's possible to preload images into an image cache, and this allows them to be presented more quickly later on uh, without timing issues. And in order to make use of this functionality, we need to load the what's called the preload plugin. Okay, so let's load the preload plugin and we can copy this and the plugin is called preload that allows us to then call it later on when we run this thing this is something you do at the very beginning of your experiment so i'm going to put the preload um, at the beginning here, just before the welcome message. Tab this over, and it is preloading these two image files. And I'm going to add the preload plugin to the timeline. And again, I want to do that at the beginning. So I'm going to do that actually before the welcome message. We might not be able to see the results of this when we reload the task, because it happens so quickly. If you have uh, more files that you're preloading and they're getting dragged off the internet, you often would see like a little progress bar showing the preload. Okay, moving on. We're on to something called timeline variables, and this is a way to conveniently uh, con use Java's use JSIC functions to help you control running multiple trials and also control how you want to do that. This starts getting into experimental design issues. How many of each type of trial do you want to run? Do you want them to be randomized? Do you want to control the order in which they're presented? JS site can help you with some of these things. And if your design gets more complicated than what JS site can handle, then you'll have to write custom JavaScript functions to achieve the experimental designs that you're looking for. In the example we'll look at here, it's pretty straightforward and simple what we're doing. Basically, we want to run uh, a whole bunch of blue trials and a whole bunch of orange trials, and we want them to be random, one or the other. So let's see how this works. We're going to start by creating an array that contains the different stimuli that are options. Okay, so let's uh, go in here and do this. And this is a funny variable, actually. It's an array because it starts and stops with uh, square brackets. The first slot of the array, this one, is 
what's in there is an object, right? Because it's got curly braces. And inside the object is a, a stimulus, uh, has a stimulus property with an image path. So we've got two objects with both image paths in there. Next, we're going to uh yeah okay so th this part of the tutorial covers a couple little things together uh, two kinds of concepts together it's very common for a particular trial in an experiment to have multiple events so instead of just seeing one event like a blue square you might see a warning signal like a, what's, a, what's sometimes called a fixation cross that would be presented in the center of the screen. This alerts the participant that a, a trial is upcoming. So the warning signal might be presented for a particular duration. Um, it may be followed by a blank interval, and then a stimulus might be presented. So that's a, you know, three kinds of events that you would need to do on a specific trial. So in this example, showing you how to achieve like multi-event displays within a trial. The strategy is to define individual uh, events. So this is called the fixation event. I'm gonna put it uh, under here, I'm just adding them down as I go. It uses the HTML keyboard response plugin that we already have loaded. The stimulus here, we could just put a plus in it, but this is uh, a div with a plus. So this is an HTML element. And then look, we have a, some style properties here that say, let's use a big font size to make the plus big when we look at it. The choices parameter has the no keys option which is a nice option, means you can't respond to this event. It just will happen. It's going to happen for 1,000 milliseconds, and then it's going to disappear. So that's the, called the trial duration, which sets how long the uh, plus will display on the screen. It's, yeah, so we've got three more things to add. The next one is another plug-in. It's called test. And it's a little bit different from what we did before with blue or orange. So each, this one here defines a single stimulus as the trial, and that just happens one time. You can always do that. This one here, the stimulus variable uh, is not to a single file. It's not to a single image. Instead, it is a function, and it's something called the jspsych.timeline variable function. And it is looking for an array that, that has objects containing stimulus properties just like this one here. We'll get to that in a moment. This, it'll become more clear how this connects. The next thing is um, a more complicated timeline variable than we've been using. So this one is a named test procedure. It's a JavaScript object. Um, I think I forgot to put the colons in there, semicolons. And it has a timeline property. This one says fixation comma test. So what it's going to do is do the fixation proper uh, plugin, which will display a plus, and then it will run this plugin, 
because it's called test. So this word is the same here, and this one is the same here. There's a new concept called timeline variables. And this connects to the array we made up here called test stimuli. Essentially what's gonna happen is when we run through this, every time we display the test event, it's going to go through the, you know, we need to know what stimulus to present. And that stimulus is being defined uh, by all of these properties here. So it's, it's gonna do the first one in this list and then the second one and so on. Last, we're gonna push test procedure to the timeline. So what should happen? It, it, we should see a blue trial, then an orange trial, and then uh, two more trials, actually, because this is a, this is a whole other way of doing additional trials. So let's see if that works. So we see the first trial, the second trial, and now these other trials, um, they are, look a little different because they've got that fixation event first followed by the, the stimulus. So that's pretty handy. We're going to start looking into what is called parameters for timelines with timeline variables. It, it almost it, it, it started to get maybe a little bit complicated, but let's walk through and see what's available to us. So this ex example is just adding one neat thing called randomize order and setting this to true. So let's go ahead and add that for ourselves adding that into this test procedure timeline variable. Okay, let me add it right there. Now, I made a mistake. And if you already know what it is, good. We can see that I made a mistake by going to and reloading and seeing, yep, got a syntax error. Sometimes it'll be good at telling you where the error is around line 86. So it's something here where we just added something. This is a prop, uh, is, look, it, we've got our first name timeline with our uh, array in it, followed by a comma. The second name followed by the thing that's in there. All of the names, uh, in a JavaScript object need to be separated by a comma. So I didn't add the comma, that was the problem. So if I wanted to add this randomized order parameter and set it to true, I needed to have that comma in there. And what's this gonna do? Well, what it's gonna do, it's going to randomize which of these two gets presented first. Sometimes it'll be blue-orange, sometimes it'll be orange-blue, cool. There's another parameter that we see being discussed, and that is the repetitions parameter. So let's go ahead and add that. Comma first, add repetitions. Uh, what do you think this is gonna do? Well, it's going to repeat this list five times. Combined, we should see 10 trials because two times five is 10, and the order of events should be random should not just be blue, orange, blue, orange, blue, orange, and it should be random. So let's find out. So the first one will be blue, the next one will be orange, and now we're going to get the random ones with the fixation cross. Blue, orange, orange, blue, orange, blue, blue, orange. Blue, orange. Yeah, so it wasn't um, 
blue, orange every single time, it will kind of alternate it a little bit randomly. If we reload the experiment, uh, we will get a new random order that we didn't see last time. So blue, orange, blue, orange, orange, blue, blue. And that'll change every time. Super helpful. We're starting to get into more advanced topics. And this one is called using functions to generate parameters. So let's check it out. We see the fixation plugin. We've already defined that. And what's happening here is they're adding a new section called trial duration. So I'm just going to copy this and head back to find the fixation cross. This one is defined currently as 1000. So that means the fixation gets displayed for 1000 milliseconds. And if I copy in, uh, we still have a trial duration parameter, but what is happening here is instead of it just being 1000 every time, we can use a function. We can put a function in here that picks a different number every time, which is pretty cool. So this function uses a JS psych internal uh, function called randomization.sample without replacement. I could see that it's a little hard to read what is happening here. I don't know if I can tab this. Uh, but basically, we are defining 250, 500, all these different numbers. These are different potential trial durations. And we're sampling, we're, uh, we're going to sample one of these without replacement. And what happens now when we run the experiment is the watch, pay attention to the plus sign and how long it is on the screen for. So sometimes it's on for shorter and longer because the duration is being sampled randomly from those different numbers. So this is very powerful, and we'll use this ability uh, many times in, as we, our experiments get more complicated. OK, so this whole time, when we've been showing stimuli and responding to them, JSIC has been recording a data in a variable, which is pretty cool. We can see that in the Firefox plugin if we were to look at it. And in this example, we're just going to uh, add the ability to see that data to the end of the experiment. So look here, we have the JS psych init JS psych. And we did this at the very beginning. So we go to the top of our code. Here it is. That's when we initialize JS psych. This is a function and we can put we can define inputs into this function that JSSIC knows about. So there's a, I guess it looks like this. We're adding, I guess, well, one thing you could do is just copy this whole thing and replace it. Okay. It's a little bit tricky to see what's been going on here. All of this is inside the parentheses. So that's it's an input to the function. What's being input is inside curly braces. So we're inputting an object. And uh, the inside that object, we're, we're defining, we're talking about the onFinish parameter. 
and we're declaring a function and this function will happen it, it will get executed when the js psych experiment finishes so we can actually inside of this function there's only one thing we could put more things and more things would happen when it finishes at this point we're just saying let's display the data and this is a custom function from JS like that will allow you to do that let's see if it works so I'm just running through this I'm gonna respond to all of these trials as quickly as I can getting close okay so it worked this is all of the data that we collected so far it's in the form of something called a javascript object notation you can start looking at it when uh, check it out what's going on and it tells you about all the events that happened in the experiment so here's the event where we preloaded the images here's the event when we put a welcome message on the screen here's the event where we put instructions on the screen Here's the very first trial that we hard coded as a blue image and then the orange image. And then the next trials had two events each. So the next trial had uh, a plus being displayed followed by a circle. And if we just focused on one of these events here, like where there's a circle, we see which, which stimulus was presented. We see what the response time was in milliseconds, how long somebody took to press the button. We see which button they pressed. We see what kind of JS like plugin was used. We see what trial index it was. What we see the total elapsed time from the beginning of the experiment and so on. It's also possible to customize what JS like is saving here, but we're it's doing a nice job of saving all the important events. All right, moving on to part 11, tagging trials with additional data. And this can, this is something you'll often want to do. It's super helpful later on when you're analyzing data. And The example here is to add a, a data parameter into your JS Psych plugin. In this one, we're going into the test plugin. So we could find that. Let's go down and find it. Here it is. Doing that comma, adding a data parameter. All right. And in this example, we're, we're going to be adding uh, what, what we see, task and response. So can, this can become quite a bit more complicated. I'm going to make all of this happen a little bit faster when I run through it and check it out. So I'm just going to set the repetitions to two. I'm also going to get rid of this blue trial and this orange trial. And when we reload, check it out. I'm just gonna press buttons real quick and try to get us through this so we can see what we added. All right, I'm scrolling down. And when we look at uh, one of the stimulus presentations, so this is when an orange circle was presented now we have a new data label and this one is called the task label and we've given it a response uh, level name so it's totally possible to add new things into the data that's being recorded We're gonna keep doing this. I guess this is actually a really nice example of something you'd 
want to add in. Um, so for example, what is the correct response to the blue circle? What is the correct response to the orange circle? You could add that right in there. And here's one way to do it. We're going to modify this piece right here where we're defining the stimuli we want to present on each trial. So here we just have a stimulus property in the, in the file name. But if we do the modification, we, we still have that. But for each stimulus, we've now added a property called correct response. And we're saying F is the correct response to a blue circle. J is the correct response to an orange circle. That's one step. And the next step is, OK, let, let's say we wanted to record that in the data file. So here, you know, when at the end of the experiment, we can see what response somebody made. So somebody pressed an F here. That was me. But it doesn't say what the actual correct response needs to be. That would be, so imagine we had another listing that said correct response F. And you can compare what the correct one was with the one that happened and know if the response was correct. So the strategy here is to add more things to the data parameter. So you could add one called correct response and uh, take that information from the timeline variable being used, which is, which is up here, and take that information from the correct response parameter in that timeline. So we're just grabbing this piece and adding another thing to record in the data file, in the data parameter. I added a comma, put this in here, and we should be good to go on this so that uh, when we run the experiment now, let's do it quickly, and look at individual trials. So for here, we can now see the correct response to a blue stimulus is an F, and we can see the given response. And this could also help us compute accuracy and store that information in the data file. The last example here is tagging the um, fixation trial. Yes. Later on when we analyze the data, you might not be interested in this piece of information. So this is a trial that uh, it displays the fixation cross, and you might not be interested in it. So you could give it a name, uh, trial um, or task or something in here, call it fixation. And then later on, you'd be able to remove things that say fixation from your analysis. And um, all they're doing is adding this little data parameter to the fixation plugin. So right here, we need a comma, pop that in. And, and now we'll start seeing that trial type being labeled in the data file. Okay, so when we see a fixation trial, now we know that this is a fixation trial versus uh, something else. And we used actually TAS, so we'd, we'd, later on we'd be looking for Respond, uh, data where the task type is response. We want to analyze those ones. Part 12, manipulating data during the experiment. And I got to pause and get a drink of water. All right, so this one's pretty neat actually. And what we're going to do is on the fly, as the trial happens, do a little bit of calculation with respect to accuracy. So this is happening in the test plugin where we're displaying a circle. We modify it up to here. We can add an unfinished parameter to this plugin also. 
instead, and this will launch some function at the end of a trial, which is pretty great. So we could have things happen um, at the end of a trial and that depend on what this function is computing. So what's going on here is we are, um, okay, we are inputting the, the, the data part of this plugin. We're going to, this is a kind of a different way to add a new um, name in here. We're gonna call it correct, data.correct. So that will be a new property name. And what we wanna say at the end of each trial is, hey, was this a correct trial? Yes, or was this an incorrect trial? want to do yes or no, or a true or false. You would, you would want to compare the actual response letter with the correct response letter. If they're the same, correct. If they're not the same, incorrect. So there's a handy uh, function from JS Psych called compare keys. And it's going to be comparing the letter in the response property of the data for that trial against the letter in the correct response property. It's going to return a logic, logical value. I'm going to go into test, add this after data. Oh, I don't need that extra comma. Press save. Make sure this is working. So I did that one correctly. I'm pretty sure that was a J. That, I'll do this incorrect, and then I'll make this one incorrect as well. We should now see new information that's been added into the data file. So there's a new parameter called correct. And I was correct on the first response. I was correct on the second response. I was not correct on the last two. So this is pretty cool. Um, we're getting close to done this tutorial and all of these things are fairly uh, advanced, but you should know they're possible. So at the end of an experiment, you should have well, typically you'll have, um, if it's a multi-experiment, multi-trial experiment, you'll have multiple observations of reaction times or accuracy values for particular trials and particular conditions. And all of that will be in that data file we were looking at. Uh, in our lab, we'll generally take those data files and input them into other programs like R to analyze them. JavaScript is also perfectly capable of analyzing that kind of stuff. And um, here is an example of creating a display at the end of an experiment that provides debriefing information to a participant and that can display aspects of the task performance. And uh, let's copy this. Go near to the end, add it in. Got to be careful about where I push the debrief block. I want to do that in order. So I'm going to do that here. And if we just quickly look at it, we're seeing, okay, it's a HTML keyboard response plugin. We're seeing a new way to use the stimulus property. I just want to contrast this in the other examples. Here's a really simple example, just text. Here's a more complicated example. We have HTML text in the stimulus parameter. Here, the stimulus parameter is actually a function. And uh, the function will get executed 
And in this function, it will return text. So you can see here, it's returning some things and that text will get displayed. So when this function gets executed, it uh, filters the data file for elements that have task response. It gets the correct trials and it counts how many trials were correct versus the total number of trials. And it gets the average reaction time, stores it in these variables, and then it presents this information to the screen. So I'm just going to uh, turn up the repetitions to five, just because that will allow me to get a better average um, for the example purpose. Reload. So I'm going to try to do this as a good participant and see how fast I can detect these things accurately. I'm trying to do it as quickly as I can see those things up here. Oh, could have been faster there. I'm getting old. Great. I responded correctly on 100% of the trials. It's showing my average response time was 444 milliseconds, which is pretty slow <laughs> for, uh, oh well. And you can press any key to complete the experiment. So this is showing the debrief plugin, which is an example of uh, using JavaScript to analyze some of the data. And at the end, all we have here is all of the code put together. So we've been going through all of this line by line and uh, one, yeah, if you wanted to get started by just copying this, boom, you could copy that into uh, a file over here and start trying to run it. So I'm just going to make this a bit smaller just to see everything. So I saved that file called test.html. Uh, I'm going to delete this. I don't need it there right now. And it's more or less the same as that example file. So your job this week is to see if you can get this working. You know, work through the example, get this example into your blog, and you know, make sure you can link to it so that someone can go to your website and run the example. I don't think I have that uh, working yet on my blog, so let me just do that part right now. Uh, okay. I'm going to say link to the uh, tutorial experiment. And I think we can just go like, let's try this. Uh, actually, I've got to double check how I did this part. I think I did it here. No, here. Yeah, oh, okay, I did it like this. Fine, I can do it like that again. Um, link to test.html. Okay, so when I render the website and go to blog, I can see the third piece go down. I can should be able to click this link and it'll run the experiments. Mm -hmm. I'm glad I am glad that I am doing this right now. It's not working. And I want to talk about why it's not working. So let's see, I'm rendering my blog. And I can see the blog post. I can, where are we doing? wrong one, sorry. 
I can see the link, but if I clicked it, it didn't work. Let's take a look at what's being copied into the docs folder. Right. Whenever we render a blog post, everything gets copied into here, and that allows us to display this on GitHub pages. So there's the third one. And oh, there's my experiment, test.html. So the file is there, which is great. The reason it's there is because I linked to it in my QMD file. And so if the QMD file detects some something that it needs to put in the docs file like this that's linked to it, it will do that. In our case, we actually need these two folders to be copied to the docs file folder as well. So we need to add something in order to accomplish this goal. And I think we can do it up here. Sorry, to, yeah, resources. These are additional things that we want to copy to the docs folder. So I should be able to type JS psych and IMG. And now when I render this web page, um, fingers crossed that this will work. Okay, that didn't work. Boo hoo. So sad for me. But let's check if it got copied into the docs folder. It did not. Hmm, maybe I'm doing it wrong. That's a good question. I'm gonna rebuild the blog. So bear with me as we do this kind of troubleshooting. Is it in the docs folder now? No, it's not. Okay, I know I've done this before. So I'm gonna go figure out what I need to write here. I'll be right back. Ooh, okay, that took longer than I wanted it to. I was mostly right, but I put the thing in the wrong spot. Bef so here's what I did. In the YAML, you have to have resources, just like we did before, comma, dash, and then the names of the folders you want to include. And it has to be, it can't be the last thing. I've got a bunch of different things here. Apparently, if I put this after the execute option didn't work but if i put it up here then it did work and what does that mean now when i render this page we get the link and uh well we can't see it here maybe does that mean it didn't work i don't i'm actually not sure and however Whoops, wow, going all over the place. Go into the docs folder, go into the blog. I just saw these things get placed in there. I might have to pause again. Okay, this is one of those weird things. Um, the Quarto documentation clearly states if this was working properly. You add resources just like this to your website, and then you can list files or folders, and um, it'll add those things to the docs file, to the docs folder. But that's what I was doing, and it wasn't working. I restarted our studio, uh, and here we have these different resources. Okay, uh, I went to the index page for my whole website. I rendered it. Once you do this, you can click on different things and it will render them for you. So I've now clicked on the third blog post, rendered it. And it, going through these steps again, I believe, no, it still didn't work. I'm so confused. Okay, bottom line, I wasn't expecting this issue. This sometimes happens working with Quarto. 
I'm not sure if there's currently a problem with my version of Corto or with RStudio or what's going on here. Uh, we'll sort this out in class. Uh, however, there's ways to solve this problem that I wasn't planning to get into until later. What I did was I went to the blog and went to Quarto.yml where we set some things up at the beginning. It's possible to add resources here under the project and um, it will copy things from your project into the docs folder. So I've got an images folder right here that I've got a few things in and because I've listed it, it automatically copies it into the docs folder for me. That's great. Now, I was just messing around. I didn't realize this was going to work. I added the JS psych folder and the IMG folder that are in this folder right here. When I did that, it actually added them into that folder over here for me, which was the goal uh, that I was trying to accomplish. So that's cool. But uh, this could be our little workaround for right now. I believe this means that now when I go to week three, I should be able to click this link. And yeah, actually it's gonna run the experiment in this little browser window. So it is finally working. All right. Now there's other problems that we'll talk about later. As we go through this course, we'll be making multiple blog posts all coding up JS Psych experiments. And we probably don't want to keep copying all of these JS Psych folders onto GitHub every single time, because we really only need one copy of these things. So next time we'll talk about moving this into a different location that's uh, more considerate of saving space. The last thing is your assignment this week is to show you can get the JS Psych demo working that we just went through. And that ended up being a choice reaction time test where you're measuring responses to one of two things. Review the, the website that I linked to right here on Donders and why you would run these kinds of tasks. Learn what a basic detection task is. Learn what a go, no go task is and see if you can produce in, uh, scripts for each of these tasks by modifying the, the one tutorial. Uh, so that's the generalization assignment to try to do for this week. All right, that's it. And we'll be, we'll be back next time with more stuff with JS Psych.